Shabbat Shalom, everybody. So good to have all of you here with us today. As many of you know, we broadcast live right now. Of course, people can watch it again anytime they want during the week. Uh, but we have had as many as 300 cities in 30 nations watching live. It's just incredible. And uh, we just appreciate everyone who's here locally, everyone around the United States. Almost every week now, we have people from every single, all 50 states watching, which is uh, uh, great, as well as, I don't know, sometimes 15 nations, up to 30 nations. But our goal, as you know, has always been to take Torah to the nations from the very beginning, and it's never changed. And so God has uh, allowed us to take part in what he's doing all over the world. And it's like these, these flashing lights around the globe I see as people that are understanding the Shabbat. And we're, we're literally, all the Jewish people are meeting all over the world today. And, you know, here we're meeting and there's non-Jews all over the world today who are studying the Torah portions. And to me, it's always about relationships. It's always about coming together. And that's what I like here is we have so many languages that are spoken here. We have so many different denominations that are here, but all of our focus is understanding uh, the Torah, which we know is the light. That's what it says. Proverbs 6, 23, the Torah is the light. And we know Yeshua is as well. And let's stand and we'll open with prayer. The greatest commandment in particular. Shema Yisrael. Adonai Eloheinu, Adonai Echad, Baruch Shem Kevod, Mahuto Leolam Vayed. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. Praised be the name of his glorious sovereignty forever and ever, and you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your might. And these words which I command you this day shall be upon your heart, and you shall teach them thoroughly to your children, and you shall speak of them when you sit in your house, when you walk on the road, when you lie down and when you rise, you shall bind them for a sign upon your hand, and they shall be for a reminder between your eyes. You shall write them on the doorpost of your house and upon your gates. When the word entered the world, freedom entered it. That's highest teaching is love and kindness. And that is the whole Torah. Go and learn it, honoring one another, doing acts of kindness, making peace. These are our highest duties. Therefore, let us learn in order to teach. She is a tree of life to those who hold fast, and all who cling to her find happiness. Her ways are ways of pleasantness, and all her paths are peace. Amen. Together. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come. Your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. Let us not enter into testing, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Mode ani lefaneka melek kai vikiyam shahekazar tabi nishmati bakemla raba emunateka. Thankful is what I am before your face, O King, living and eternal, for restoring my soul within me with compassion. Great is your faithfulness. Amen. Say Shabbat Shalom to somebody and have a seat. Shabbat Shalom.
All right, just a couple of quick announcements. Uh, as everyone knows, today at 2.30 after the second service, we're going to have tour club here. Anyone can join. On Tuesdays, we have a prayer time at 1 in the afternoon. And on Thursdays from 10 to 11.30, we have manna time going over the Torah portion. As everyone knows, this month is almost over. We're almost into next year on the Gregorian calendar. Uh, the nice thing is, I tell you what, if, how many of you believe you need to be on God's calendar? Okay, well, guess what? These make the best Hanukkah Christmas presents you can ever get. If you love your family, you need to get them on the calendar because this one literally goes all the way to 2026. And of course, we have the America at War, not only as a physical book, but as a digital download for everybody. And we have uh, the Mark Bills Phonetic New Testament, and you get it at esm.us forward slash Bible. And we, Danny and I, really believe that this will be the number one most scholarly, literally translated online Bible for the 21st century. We want to remind everybody it is online only. I was at Danny's yesterday, and now we're going through the Torah, and we're, we're, we already made, yeah, not just the Torah, I mean, that's what we're working on, but we're working on the whole Tanakh, and we already have about, almost like 7,000 changes. Yeah, uh, we've done different things, but you will not believe how many, how bad the English translation really is, especially in the prophets. Uh, it talks about the burden of the Lord. Wrong word. It's the prophecy, the word of the Lord. Uh, but there are so many mistranslations in the English. So that's why we're doing the Hebrew, the Hebrew transliteration, and then the corrected English, just like with the New Testament. There's so many uh, mistranslations, it's horrible. So we're really excited about this Bible. Now, guess what? Hanukkah starts Wednesday night, December 25th. Uh, our party though, it will be Sunday night, the 29th at 5 p.m. Party, party. How many of you have ever been to a Hanukkah service? Oh, we have the best Hanukkah service in the world. So here we are. We are on the 7th right now. Hanukkah starts Christmas night. And then the 29th uh, will be our party. Oh, I don't know if Giomi or Nick can hear me. Earth to Giomi. Earth to Nick. Okay. How many of you do not have a Hanukkah menorah thing to put candles in? We have some we're going to give away for free. And so we just wanted you to know that uh, I'll try to get it done at the, the break or something. We'll try to have some up here. Those of you that don't have a Hanukkah menorah for this Hanukkah, we're going to give you one. And over the next couple of weeks, since we still have a couple of weeks to Hanukkah, I uh, will also pass out notes for everyone to understand. And I'll be teaching about Hanukkah. How many of you have never been to a Hanukkah service? So most of you have. Some of you haven't. Uh, how many of you that have never been to a Hanukkah service, when I say Matthew 24, we need those free Hanukkah gold and silver things up here. Thanks. Uh, Matthew 24 is all about Hanukkah happening again. And so we have to understand Matthew 24 is talking about end times. But if you don't understand, it's talking all about Hanukkah happening again. You're going to miss a big connection. Now, I'm very excited about this. How many of you know we've been trying to go to Israel for like three times? We keep getting canceled by all the airlines. Well, it's not going to happen this time. We're going to fly El Al. And they go. There's nothing stopping the El Al airline. So this coming May, this coming May is going to be the 4th through the 15th of May. We're going to have a tour to Israel. Of course, we're going in October as well. So we're going to go in May, and we're going to go again in October. <clears throat> this one in May is going to be absolutely incredible. Of course, we're going to start out uh, leaving from wherever you are across the United States, around the world. And we're all going to land in Tel Aviv. And then the first day uh, after we arrive at Ben Gurion Airport, we usually arrive like 3, 4, 5 in the afternoon. Uh, everyone's exhausted. And so we uh, go and we're going to have a nice dinner and then spend the night in Tel Aviv right there. And we'll have a little meet and greet after dinner. And then on Tuesday, we're going to go to the Ayalon Institute. You know what's amazing about that? Does anyone know about the Ayalon Institute? This is where there was a 
British prison camps to hold the Jews. The Jews are fleeing Germany, they get to Israel, and then the British have a concentration camp they throw the Jews in. And so you're going to visit this place where <clears throat> the British housed all the Jewish people fleeing the Holocaust, but unbeknownst to them, they made a bullet factory underground, and they were right, right there, the very spot where this internment camp is, they were making bullets, and the Brits never knew it. And uh, you're going to go down there and find the little secret uh, thing it's like a washer or dryer they move in this laundry room and then there's stairs going underneath uh, But there's some exciting stories about that Okay, and then after that Caesarea, which is right on the coast and this is where Herod uh, Got eaten up by worms and all this kind of stuff, but Caesarea is gorgeous it's, You'll see all of the ancient stuff that's there from 2,000 years ago and then of course Megiddo everyone's familiar with Megiddo We're gonna go there and then we're going to spend the night in the Galilee. Uh, and from there, while we're at the Galilee, we're going to go to Capernaum, where Peter was, Yeshua was. And the original foundation of Yeshua's synagogue is still there that Yeshua went into. And then uh, we'll spend the night uh, in the Galilee again. And uh, let's see, yeah, Mount of Beatitudes. We'll have a nice fish lunch, Magdala, a boat ride on the Sea of Galilee, which is absolutely incredible. And then Thursday, we're going to do a beautiful land initiative project. I think we're going to kind of help clean up, you know, things like that, because we want to be involved doing things. Uh, and then we're going to have a phenomenal uh, boat ride uh, on the Sea of Galilee. Yeah, so Sita, Mount Arbel, which is over there. We're going to, those that want to be baptized in the Jordan, uh, we're going to do that over in the Galilee. And then... We're going to go to Beit Shan. This is where uh, Saul died and his head was hung up on a pole and all kinds of uh, things that happened. We're going to head down to Qumran where the Dead Sea Scrolls were found. And we're going to spend two nights at the Dead Sea. Oh, that is incredible. Uh, Saturday, we'll be at Masada uh, and Getty and again at the Dead Sea. And then Sunday, we're going to go to uh, Genesis land. You can Google that. It's really incredible. Uh, the Western Wall, we'll go to the tunnels under the Western Wall, City of David, Southern Steps, and then spend the night in Jerusalem. And the next day, we're going to go to Shiloh. This is uh, an incredible place where the temple literally stood for like 368 years. Uh, then the Holocaust Museum, Yad Vashem, there'll be a light show at the Tower of David, again in Jerusalem. And then on Tuesday, the Temple Mount, uh, Emek Zarim, you all get to help do sifting. You're going to work at an archaeological site, uh, which will be a lot of fun. The Antonia Fortress, Pools of Bethesda. We'll do the Mount of Olives, the Garden of Gethsemane, and then the fun is Ben Yehuda Street. Uh, and then again in Jerusalem, but check out this on Wednesday. Uh, we're going to visit Jeremy Gimpel, uh, the Herodian where Herod dies, but then we're going to Hebron, uh, the Cave of Machpelah, and then off we go. So anyway, we'll have the price here up by the end of this next week, uh, but it's going to be pretty much competitive like what it's been before. Curtis, come on up. Let's stand. Come on up, musicians. Musicians, come on up. All right, let's pray. Avinu, Mokainu. Our Father, our King, we just thank you so much for everything that you're doing in each one of our lives. And I just pray right now, Lord, that every single one of us would have ears to hear, eyes to see, a heart to understand what you're trying to tell us, because your word is for all time. And we pray that even as Curtis blows the shofar, it would break up any fallow ground in our hearts. In Yeshua's name, amen.
Amen. Amen. Amen. And Shabbat Shalom. Please remain standing. We're going to worship the Lord today. Amen. Today, December the 7th, is a great day to worship Him. Amen. Let's give Him some praise. We have a great In a motto, he name la 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 Top of his head to the edge of his robe. He nay, he nay, mato. He nay, mato, umanai. Shevet akim gamiaka. He nay, mato, umanai. Shevet akim gamiaka. He nay, mato. team. All right. We have a phenomenal Torah study this morning. Now, as you can see up on the screen, that is our, not our Torah portion. There is our Torah portion. All right. And what does that word say? 
Vayetze. That's right. And what does it mean? That's what it means. And he went out. This is about Jacob as he's leaving the promised land. And what's so fascinating, when you read this Torah portion, as he's leaving, the sun is setting. It's getting dark. But when he returns in the next Torah portion, it says the sun is rising. And so it's, it's quite uh, the story that God is developing here. But I want to start with the end of last week's Torah portion, which is the beginning of Genesis 28. Look at verse 1 through 5. Here we see Isaac calls his son Jacob. He blesses him, and then he charged him and said to him, you are not to take a wife of the daughters of Canaan. And why did Isaac say that? The Canaanites are cursed. Okay. And that is why uh, Abraham told the Eliezer, when you go find a wife for my son Isaac, don't marry the Canaanites. And if you remember, Ham is the father of Canaan, who was cursed, and Shem is still alive during Abraham's time. They've all died, but uh, Shem is still alive. And so he's talking to Abraham for almost 75 years, telling him all about the trip on the boat and everything that happened, and how Ham was cursed and Canaan was cursed. And so that's why Abraham, who knew Shem, even knew Noah for 15 years, and so, I mean, he got a, a, some good lessons. And so he told Eliezer, make sure Isaac doesn't marry Canaanite. And then Isaac, you know, tells his son Jacob, make sure you don't marry a Canaanite. And Esau was 40 years old when he got married. And the first thing he did was marry two Canaanites. And he saw that mom and dad, Isaac and Rebecca, were not too happy with his choices. And so... It says that Esau, in Genesis 28, 8, 9, seeing that the daughters of Canaan did not please Isaac, his father, then Esau went to Ishmael and took the wives which he had, Mahalat, the daughter of Ishmael, Abraham's son, the sister of Nabaioth, to be his wife. So now we begin the Torah portion with verse 10. And Jacob, Vayetze, he went out from Beersheba, he went toward Haran, and then it says, and it depends on your translation. I don't know what it says in the Korean or the Russian or the Spanish, but it says in the English here, in one of the 900 different English translations, uh, he came to a certain place. Another translation says he lighted on a certain place. Place. Whenever it says a certain place, that tells us there's something very special about this particular place. And when it says he lighted on it or came to, the Hebrew word is paga. Now, what's fascinating about this particular word, which means he came to, and we know he came to a certain place, the word paga means a place where there will be a divine encounter. So you miss that in English. This certain place that he came to was a place he would have a divine encounter. And then it says, he tarried there all night because the sun was set. And then he took of the stones of that place, put them for pillows, and laid down in that place. Notice how it keeps talking about that place, that place, certain place. So this place is very important. It's too bad he didn't have my pillow back then. <laughs> he had to use a rock for pillows. Okay. So Jacob's descent from the land of promise, we have to think of as a descent into darkness. So Jacob's exile is also symbolic of spiritual darkness. All right? But this is a divine place that he came to. As a matter of fact, the word, the place, is in Hebrew, makom. That certain place is makom. Well, guess what? The root word of this is kum, which means to rise up. And guess what happened? This place is Jerusalem. And this is where the Lord was risen up. 
So this is incredible that the very word of the place, this important place, is a divine encounter, and it comes from the word, a place where there will be resurrection from the dead. Right in that word. So this is a very special place. Now, let me show you this. Okay, here is the same sentence, but I have the Hebrew and the Hebrew transliteration here. And uh, what's so exciting about what Danny and I are doing, too, is, is because in the, the Torah that we're doing, of course, you'll have the Hebrew, you have the Hebrew transliteration, and then you'll also have the English, but we're replacing all the English errors. But I have the red arrow pointing to the word ha Evan, And ha is what in Hebrew? The. The. Okay. Eben, as you can see in the Hebrew transliteration, ha in black underline, red underline is Evan, the, okay. Now, look at the stone in English. I underlined the stone because that's ha Evan, and up there is ha Evan. Now, let's look at the word for stone is the Aleph Beit Noon. And you can see that up top, the Aleph Beit Noon, that's the word for stone. And then what's fascinating is the Aleph Tav stone. And of course, the Aleph Tav isn't really translated into English. It refers to the direct object. But I think it's fascinating that God is the Aleph Tav. So this is an Aleph Tav stone. Okay. Now, watch this. In Psalm 1822, concerning the stone, there's a stone that the builders refuse. And that's what become the headstone of the corner. So we know there, this, why do they reject the stone? Well, watch this up on the screen very closely. Av is father. Ben is son. We have the word stone means the father and son together as one. And that's what they rejected. Isn't that amazing? The stone the builders rejected, and the stone is made up of the father and the son, in the Hebrew word for stone, as one stone. Now, how many of you have ever been on the Temple Mount? Okay, some of you have. I've been up there many times. And, of course, the, this is called the Al-Aqsa Mosque. And then over there, what do they call that big gold dome there? It's the Dome of the Rock. Why is it called the Dome of the Rock? Because inside is the very rock Abraham was going to slay Isaac on. This is where the Holy of Holies was. The Holy of Holies was right here over the Dome of the Rock where Jacob's father Isaac was almost killed by his grandpa Abraham. So that's why they call it the Dome of the Rock, because it has inside the foundation of the world. This, is, this was the rock that Abraham was going to offer up Isaac on. Now, what's fascinating about the Dome of the Rock, and I have uh, my own pictures of this. I've gone right up next to it, and you can see these mosaics on here. Do you see those? Here is one mosaic. I cannot believe, but it's so fitting for the Dome of the Rock. What do you see? Do you see Satan? You have his two eyes, his mouth, ears, and it's reversed. Does anybody see that? Do you see what I'm talking about? Isn't that crazy? Anyway, so let's go on. Now, we read that what Jacob did after he woke up, uh, he erected a pillar and he poured oil on it. And then he named this site Bethel, which means the house of God, which is why the house of God was built there. And uh, Jacob, he's sleeping on a stone, and then God reveals this ladder all the way to heaven. Let's bring in our ladder. Dun -dun -dun! All the way to heaven. Now, uh, sleep often represents death in the Bible. The latter itself represents the Messiah with his death and resurrection being symbolic of Messiah's descent and ascent. And now the Lord appears to him for the very first 
time. And look at Genesis 28, 12 and 13. He dreams and behold, a ladder is set up on the earth and the top of it reached all the way to heaven. And then it says, and behold, the angels of God were ascending and descending and behold, the Lord stood above it. You know what's amazing? It's referring to the ladder, but there, the every noun is either he uh, is either masculine or feminine, like in Spanish. And this really, there is no it in the Bible. This literally could be read, behold, the Lord stood above him. So he's looking down at him and he said, I am the Lord God of Abraham, your father, and the God of Isaac, the land that you're lying to you, I will give it and to your seed. And so here we see these angels are coming in his dream. And then we have other angels and they're ascending and descending. Now, the sages always wondered, why were they ascending and descending? Well, it's shift change. Okay. The ones that are ascending are the ones who are the angels over the Holy Land. The ones that are descending are the ones that will accompany him out of the Holy Land, which I thought was kind of interesting as well. Now. The sages even disagreed, saying the angels were not going up and down it, but were going up and down him, as if the Messiah himself is the ladder that the angels are descending upon. As a matter of fact, if you look at John 1, 49 through 51, Nathaniel says to him, Rabbi, you are the Son of God. You're the Messiah. You are the King of Israel. And Yeshua answered and says, you have faith because I told you I saw you under a fig tree. You're going to see greater things than this. And he said, truly, I tell everybody, you will see heaven opening and God's angels going up and down, coming down on what? That's what I'm saying. The New Testament even confirms it was the Messiah that is the connection between heaven and earth. And look at Isaiah 33:22. The Lord is our judge. Now, when you see all caps, that means the Hebrew word is what? yud heh vav -Hey. The Lord is our judge. The Lord is our lawgiver. The Lord is our king, and he will save us. And here, Nathaniel just called him the king of Israel. He's saying, you are deity. Now, along that line, look at John 3, verse 13. No one has ascended up to heaven but the one that came down from heaven, even the son of man, which is in heaven. So he descended and then he ascended. Now look at this drum roll. Proverbs 30 verse 4 talks about this. Who has ascended up into heaven and descended? Who has gathered the wind in his fist? Who has bound the waters in his garment? Who has established all the ends of the earth? Okay, so this is a quiz. Okay, we're having a quiz. Who's the one who established all the ends of the earth? God, the Yudei Vavhe. But look at this. It says, what is his name and what is his son's name, if you know? Uh-oh, there's two beings here. There's what is his name, what is his son's name? Now, what do the Jews all call God's name? They don't say yud heh vav -Hey, because they don't want to say the name of God. Hashem. Hashem. Ha is the. Name is Shem. So here is the hey, the shin, and the m, the mem. So that's how you spell Hashem. I want everyone to see. Look at these letters. The hey, the shin, the mem. The na what is his name? So if you were a Jew and you were going to answer this, what is his name? You would say Hashem. What is his son's name? I don't know. Okay? But are you ready for this? This is going to be mind-blowing. Off the charts. I put Hebrew or Proverbs 30, 4 through 6 in an Excel spreadsheet. Now, what I have here, the letter mem is where verse 4 starts. And, of course, it goes this way. And every line keeps going all the way till it ends. Verse 6 ends with the top. In yellow here is where it says, and what is his name? 
And you see the vav is the word end. Ma is what? Shem is name. And then you have the vav at the end is his son's name. Or, or his name, I mean. I'm sorry. Yeah. What is his son's name? So here in Hebrew is the phrase, what is his son's name? And then down here, it says, and don't you be adding to his words. Okay. Now, what is his name? Hashem. Well, look at this. Right there is the word Hashem. In code, it's telling us, well, his name is Hashem. So right there, it tells us when you combine that, well, it's Hashem. Well, what is his son's name? Well, guess what? There is Yeshua. Right here is Yeshua. That is his son's name. Okay, right there. Yeshua. And it forms a cross. Hashem and Yeshua. Now, but wait. There's more. Here, Yeshua was baptized, and straightway he comes up out of the water, and what happens? The heavens were open, and he saw the Spirit of God descending like a dove and lighting upon him, and lo, a voice from heaven saying, this is my beloved Son in whom I'm well pleased. Now, what's the Hebrew word for spirit? Ruach, the resh, the vav, and the het. Well, guess what? Right here is the Ruach, the Spirit of God, descending upon Yeshua in that very verse over the cross. But wait, there's even more. Here it is, Proverbs 30, verse 4. What is his name and what is his son's name? Okay, here we have what is Ma, Shemo. Okay, his son's name, and what is his son's name, if you can tell? Well, I want you to notice this. Here in Exodus, where they're calling out the manna, now we know Yeshua was the bread from heaven. He is the manna, and look at this. It says, now your English translations aren't actually correct, because again, it says it, but it's masculine. So it really should say, and the house of Israel call his name, manna. So right there telling you the, one of the Messiah's name is manna. And I want you to notice it's the mem and the noon. Do you see that? That is the manna. But the reason why we can do that is because up here, it's the same thing. And it is his name. Well, right here is also the word man or manna. So what is his name? Wow, he's manna, the bread that came down from heaven. And it's Yeshua. So anyway, I always thought that was pretty cool. Okay, now go to Genesis 28, 15. God is saying to Jacob, look, I'm with you, and I'm going to keep you everywhere you go. And then he says, I'm going to bring you back. I'm not going to leave you until I've done that which I have spoken to you of. So here Jacob slash Israel leaves, but there's a promise he's going to return. And so in verse 17 through 19, Jacob is terrified, and he said, how dreadful is this place? This is none other but the house of God. This is the gate of heaven. This is why I love going to Jerusalem and going up to the Temple Mount. That is the very gate of heaven. It's, oh my gosh, when you're there, heaven's a local call. Okay, <clears throat> and it says, Jacob rose up early in the morning, and he took the stone, not just any stone, the Aleph Tav, the father and the son stone that he put for his pillows. He set it up for a pillar. Then he pours oil on it, like we said, and he called the name of that place Bethel. Now, some people, there's a city called Bethel in Israel, but that's not the Bethel he's referring about. You can have a Palestine, Alabama, and that doesn't make it Palestine. Okay, so... This is the first anointing in the Torah, is him pouring oil on that rock. And of course, the anointing is the word Mashiach, meaning Messiah. All right. Um, let's see. Uh, Genesis 28, 20 through 22, Jacob takes an oath and he says, if God's going to be with me and he keeps me safe and gives me food and clothing, 
so that I come back again to my father's house, then I will take the Lord to be my God. And this stone, which I put up for a pillar, will be God's house. And of all you give me, I will give a tenth. So here where he's initiating a tithing concept. But I think it's interesting. It says, but if you don't, God, it's not going to happen. <laughs> he's testing God. Okay, chapter 29, 1 and 2. So Jacob goes on his journey, comes to the land of the people of the east. He looks, there's a well in the field, and there were three flocks of sheep lying by it. For out of that well, they watered all the flocks. And look at this. There was a great stone on the mouth. And then in Genesis 29, 4 through 6, Jacob said to them, Brother, and where did you come from? And they said, we come from Haran. And he said, well, have you any knowledge of Laban, the son of Nahor? And they said, yes. And he said, is he well? And they said, he is. And here is his daughter, Rachel, coming with the sheep. Now, do you know what the Hebrew name for Rachel means in Hebrew? She's a lamb. She's the lamb, a she lamb, a ewe. Okay, so what happens in Genesis 29, 10, and 11, when Jacob saw Rachel, the daughter of Laban, his mother's brother, and the sheep of Laban, his mother's brother, Jacob went near. He rolled the stone from the well's mouth. You can see he's trying to impress her with how strong she is. You know, ah, I'll move this rock. And watered the flock of Laban, his mother's brother, and Jacob kissed Rachel, and he lifted up his voice and wept. What's fascinating, that's the same Thing that Esau did. He lifted up his voice and wept when he realized he didn't get the blessing. Well, so then what happens? Here we are in Genesis 29, 15. I mean, if you remember, Laban thought he really scored when the Eliezer came for Rebekah, his sister, because he saw all the money. And now here comes Jacob and he's looking for the money. <laughs> and he don't have any. And so he's a little disgusted. But he says to, uh, Laban says to Jacob, because you're my brother, should you serve me for nothing? Tell me, what shall your wages be? And in verse 18 through 20, we see that Jacob loved Rachel. And he said, I will serve you for seven years for Rachel, your younger daughter. And Laban said, oh, it's better I give her to you than I should give her to someone else. Stay with me. So Jacob served seven years for Rachel, but they seemed like a few days for the love he had to her. Okay, now, who's the elder of Jacob and Esau? Esau. Who's the elder of Rachel and Leah? So Leah belonged to Esau anyway. Okay. And then Rachel belonged to Jacob, and that's who he wants. But what happens, we know what happens. In Genesis 29, 25 through 27, in the morning, Jacob saw that it was Leah. He may have had too much to party on. <laughs> and he said to Laban, what have you done? Wasn't I working for you so that I might have Rachel? Why have you been false to me? And Laban said, in our country, we don't let the younger daughter be married before the older. Then he said, let the week of the bride feast. Now, what does that tell you when you read the week of the bride feast? Seven days, which also implies seven years. Like the tribulation, the bridal feast is seven years. The wedding takes place on the first day, and the wedding supper takes place on the seventh day. Now, as I told you, there's going to be some people who make it to the wedding. And then there's going to be some people who don't make it to the wedding, but they make it to the wedding feast. This is, you know, eschatology, but I, I want you to kind of get a load of this. Okay, and so what happened, Jacob actually got both at the same time. But he had to work another seven years to earn the fact that he gets both of them at the same time. So he said, let the week of the bride feast come to its end, and we will give you the other in addition, if you will be my servant for another seven years. And so Jacob did so and fulfilled her week and gave him Rachel, his daughter to wife. Now, here's a couple of interesting things. Get a load of this. Now, this is really important to catch this. I want you to realize when Jacob started working, he was only, he was 77 years old 
When he worked the first seven years, he was 84 years old when he got both Rachel and Leah. He works the seven years for Rachel, okay, and the seven more years. So now Joseph is born when Jacob is 91 years old, and then he has to work six years for the livestock. You realize when Jacob wrestles the angel, he's 97 years old. This is your biblical math. Can you imagine? 97 years old, and he won. <laughs> All right. And Joseph at this time when he was wrestling the angel was six years old. Now, let me uh, set it this way for you. He worked seven years for Rachel, and of course, they had no kids. Okay, now he gets both, but he has to work another seven years, and that's when all the kids were born. Okay, so he had 13 kids in seven years, all right, because he's got four wives. And then the last six years, when he works for the livestock, no more kids are born. The last kid is Benjamin, and he's not born until they're already in the promised land, all right? So I want to show you how math is so much fun. Look at this. If he worked a total of 20 years, but Reuben is born the first year when he gets both of them, how old is Reuben going to be when he leaves? He's going to be like 13 years old. So I want you to see that the math tells you how old all the kids were when he wrestled the angel. And so here, Leah had four kids first, Reuben, Simeon, Levi, and Judah. And then Bilah had her two, and Zilpah had her two, and then Leah had three more, and then Rachel finally had Joseph because Leah had Dinah, all right? So when you look at this, these are the ages of all the kids. Joseph and Dinah are both six years old when they left. This is the order of their birth. We know that from reading the context, who was born when. We know it takes a nine months to have a baby. And so, but when you look at the other wise, you can see within that seven year period, and what, six plus seven? 13, hello, seven years. And then when they, remember when... Um, they raped Dinah, okay? Dinah was only 10 years old. That's how old she was. And the boys, when they killed all of them for what they did to Dinah, they were in their teens. They were 14, 15, and 16 years old when they slew all of the Shechemites in Shechem. And then you can see how old they were when they sold Joseph. You can see how old they were when they entered Egypt. And then how old they were when Jacob uh, blessed them and they were about to die. So that's what this chart uh, shows you. And then we find here in uh, Genesis 29, 22, and 23, it says, Labor, Laban gathered together all the men of the place and made a feast. You know what this is? The first bachelor party. <laughs> Mentioned in the Bible. It's right here. It's biblical. They have bachelor parties. And they made a feast, and it came to pass in the evening. He took Leah's daughter and brought her to him, and he went unto her. Okay, so at this uh, bachelor party, he was 77 years old, Jacob was, at his bachelor's party. Okay, so uh, let's go to Genesis 29, 25 through 27. It says, in the morning, Jacob saw it was Leah, and he said, Laban, what have you done? Was I not working for you that I might have Rachel? And uh, he says, I'm not working for you. Uh, why have you been false to me? Laban said, in our country, we don't do this. All right. So Genesis 29, 33, Leah conceives again and bore another son and said, because the Lord has, what? Heard. I was hated. He's therefore given me this son also. And she called his name, what? Simeon. Well, guess What? The second half is all about Simeon. So we're going to talk all about Simeon and where this name came from. But one thing I want you to notice is she was hated. Now, how many of you know sometimes the baby picks up all your emotions? You know, and here she's feeling like she's totally hated all this time. And then in Genesis 29, 34 and 35, 
uh, is where she ca called his name Simeon. And then 34 and 35, uh, she was with child again, gave birth to son, and said, now at last my husband will be united to me because I've given him three sons. So his name was Levi, which means to join. And she was with a child again, gave birth to a son, and she said, this time I will praise the Lord. So he was named Judah, which means to praise. After this, she had what? No more children for a time. She ends up having three more, okay? Uh, uh, Zebulun, Issachar, and Dinah. Now, let's go to Genesis 35 through 8. And so Rachel is all upset and gives him Bilhah, and she gave birth to a son, and Rachel says, God has been my judge, has given ear to my voice, has given me a son. So he was named Dan, and Dan means judge. And again, Bilhah, Rachel's servant, was with child and gave birth to a second son. And Rachel said, I have had a great fight with my sister. I've overcome her. And she gave the child the name of Naphtali, which means to wrestle. Okay, now as we wrap things up, look at Genesis 30. Verse 9 through 13, when it was clear to Leah that she would have no more children for a time, she gives Zilpah, her servant, to Jacob as a wife. And Zilpah, Leah's servant, gave birth to a son, and Leah said, oh, it has gone well for me, and she gave him the name of Gad. And then Zilpah, Leah's servant, gave birth to a second son, and Leah said, happy am I, and all the women will give witness to my joy, and she gave him the name happy. Asher means happy. And then look at Genesis 30, verse 18 and 19. Leah said, God has made payment to me for giving my servant girl to my husband. So she gave her son the name of Issachar. And then uh, she became pregnant with a child and she gave Jacob a sixth son. And then in verse 20 and 21, she said, God has given me a good bride price. Now at last will I have my husband living with me, for I've given him six sons, and she gave him the name Zebulun, and after that she had a daughter to whom she gave the name Dinah. And then in Genesis 30, 24, she gave this next child, Rachel gave her child Joseph, saying, may the Lord give me another one, which, or another son, which means to add, okay, and that's what happened. She ended up having Benjamin. But look at Genesis 31, 41. Here we see exactly what I was talking about. Jacob says, these 20 years I've been in your house. I was your servant for 14 years, okay? Seven years for each daughter. Six years I kept your flock, and 10 times was my payment changed. I think it's interesting. At the very beginning, Laban said, what do you want your wages to be? It doesn't matter. He's going to change it 10 times anyway, you know. But uh, I just wanted you to catch the idea that it's 20 years. And therefore, we know how old these kids were when they left. And then in Genesis 32, verse 1 through 4, on his way, Jacob comes face to face with the angels of God. And when he saw them, he said, this is the army of God. So he gave that place the name of Mahanaim, which is like two hosts, two armies, one on earth and the one in heaven. And then Jacob sends servants before him to Esau, his brother, in the land of Seir, which is the country of Edom. And look at what he said. He gave them orders. I want you to tell Esau these exact words that your servant Jacob says till now I've been living with Laban. So I think it's interesting that Jacob says, look, I'm your servant Esau. Okay, he's got a bunch of teenagers and he's thinking, you know, how in the world are they going to defend me against Esau and all of his army? Uh, now, quiz, some of you know this. Who was one of Esau's grandchildren? His first grandchild. Esau's first grandchild. Amalek. Amalek. And do you remember what the name Amalek means? Hittite means terrorist. What does Amalek mean? A nation who chops up body parts. And that's exactly what happened on October 7th. Hamas came in, which means violence. And they were chopping up body parts. And so his grandson is Amalek. Now, 
which son of Jacob gave him the first Jewish grandchild? Which one of the sons, the 12 tribes, gave him his first grandson that was Jewish? Drum roll. All right, I will tell you. It was Judah. Now, if you remember, Judah first married a Canaanite and had three kids by a Canaanite mother, so they're not considered Jewish. But he ended up lying with Tamar, his son's wife, and who was born, Peretz and Zerah. And so Peretz is the line of David. When you go to the end of the book of Ruth, <clears throat> it talks about the genealogy of Peretz, and we see that's where David comes from. And so I think it's fascinating. You have Peretz versus Amalek. And then you end up having uh, David from the tribe of Judah versus Goliath, okay? And that brings us down to the church today. I believe we have the woke church and the awakened church. The woke church is going to go back to all their pagan gods like Oprah did, Orpah, and not Oprah, <laughs> but Orpah. And, but the awakened church they're the ones that are going to befriend Israel. So with that said, let's stand. All right. Avinu <clears throat> Makenu, our Father King, we just thank you so much that we we're able just to look into your Torah portion and uh, go hash out the history again and take a look at things and reveal to us things that we've never seen before. And Father, I just want to thank you right now for all of the lights the lights of the world all around here locally, around the United States, around the whole world. How precious are these lights that are wanting to magnify the Torah, make it honorable once again. We thank you for any tithes, offerings, donations that come in because it's not for us. It's for you, and we want to use this to help reach all of the nations of the world, that they could see the light of your Torah in Yeshua's name. Amen. Together, blessed are you, Lord our God, creator and king of the universe. You have blessed us with a whole counsel of your living word by the power of your Holy Spirit. Through the completed work of Messiah Yeshua, you alone have planted among us life eternal. Blessed are you, Lord our God. Amen. Take a break.